All right. With that, Barb, you want to uh, go ahead and introduce our speaker? Yes. Uh, this month's chapter meeting uh, is Dr. Marcella Kelly. She's going to share her work about local carnivore, carnivores, focusing on bears and bobcats and coyotes. She is uh, Associate Department Head for Graduate Affairs and the Graduate Program for BT. She has a BS and a PhD with the University of California. And her research focuses primarily on carnivore population ecology management and conservation. And she will fill us in on how that project is, is working. Thanks, Marcella. Great, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Um, I guess I'd need to share my screen, right? Oh yeah, looks like I can do that. And I guess let me know when um, you can see it. So I think it might take a second to pop up. Okay, it looks like it's there. Okay, great. Yeah, so I'm going to talk today about some of the work primarily that we've been doing in Bath County, Virginia. Um, and we started doing work there in 2011 um, on, on carnivores. And so, um, yeah, trying to distill everything we've done down into one talk, I realize is a little bit tricky. So I'm, <laughs> I might skip some sections and, and, and pass over some things, but if you have any questions, um, you can, I don't actually mind if people interrupt or, or if we just save them for the end, either way is fine for me. Um, okay, trying to move forward here. Ah, there we go. Okay, so um, I always like to start with a little bit of background um, as I've learned more and more about the ecology of the Appalachian Mountains and, and realizing that we have quite a different ecosystem than we had at the time of, say, colonization when we had mountain lions and wolves and large populations of bears. Um, all of those, many of those species were either completely extirpated or uh, their numbers were substantially reduced. Um, and if you look at this picture here, we've got um, 400 years ago, what this map is depicting is the, the gray uh, shading with the arrows is showing you uh, the expansion of coyotes. So there were no coyotes in Virginia and they have steadily uh, expanded and, and really, really kind of the Appalachian Mountains is sort of the last place in Virginia that they, these two like fronts collided. And so we've got kind of also a new predator on the landscape. Here's what that looks like. Um, today, the expansion routes that we think that coyotes have, um, where they have moved from. So sort of a Northern expansion route and a Southern expansion route into Virginia. And Virginia is kind of like the meeting place of these two um, uh, expansion fronts. So how this project came about originally in 2011 was um, this graph I'm showing you here is, is really about uh, deer numbers. So um, the redder the color, the, the larger the decline in deer numbers across the state. And public land is on the left and private is on the right. So in public land, actually the Appalachian Mountains has seen, had seen a lot of uh, deer declines um, as the, the forest had matured and become um, more like old growth forest, which is not prime habitat for deer. So they like successional um, or early successional, mid successional type forests. Um, and then the same is true on private lands, although it's not as dramatic a, of a, um, of uh, why it's not, it's not as dramatically widespread, although you will see Bath County there um, with uh, a large decline, which is where we ended up doing our study. So. Due to all of this, the game department contacted me and we worked back and forth with proposals to try to figure out what was going on. And was it coyotes that were actually killing these, these, this new predator on the landscape? Was it actually killing off uh, deer? Oops, and some little arrows there. 
So that led to the, what was originally called the Virginia Appalachian Coyote Study to study spatial ecology, demography, and feeding ecology of coyotes. And here you can see one of our first collared coyotes in the bottom right um, to, with a GPS collar to look at its uh, space, space use and um, feeding ecology. And so here we are, this is where the Coyote study took place again, right in that nexus of the fronts of the two of where the populations were moving into, um, and to look at these impacts potentially on prey populations, specifically white-tailed deer. Again, that county in Bath County is a, an area that is known for hunting. It's like a place where people go on sort of uh, hunting retreats. And so there was a lot of outcry about this lack of uh, deer or decline in deer populations. So I'm gonna distill a lot of research over the over years into what, what the animals ate. So we collected uh, poop samples across the landscape and then we analyzed them genetically to determine if they came from a coyote, a bobcat or a bear. And then we looked at what were the contents in that diet. And so um, what happened was deer were a substantial component in terms of frequency of occurrence in coyote diet. You can see there over 75, five to 80%, but bobcats had a fairly high amount of deer in their diets as well. Um, not quite as high, but bears also had a, a substantial component of deer in their diet. So we, so these were just results that we um, got from the scat analysis. And the, this was kind of surprising to, um, to folks at the game department. So poor little deer, they, they're getting it from all ends is what I like to say. <laughs> so you've got them being hit by coyotes, bears, and bobcats. So then that led, um, oh, and then I just wanna make sure that you understand this backdrop that the George Washington National Forest is, is predominantly um, mature, deciduous hardwoods, and it's pretty much um, very homogeneous or just like a monocrop of, you know, kind of old trees. And so um, it's not particularly good uh, habitat. Sometimes people are surprised by that. Not good habitat for deer. It has pretty low nutritional um, carrying capacity for deer and a lot of other species. So the question the game department wanted to know now, and they funded us for some more research, is if the habitat quality is poor and they're getting mortality from all three predators, so not just bobcats, I mean, not just coyotes, but we also know now from bobcats and bears, that maybe this could kind of push an already stressed population over the over the hump and over and into a declining population. So that led to this Appalachian carnivore study, which expanded the original Appalachian coyote study to, um, to now look at bobcats and bear impacts as well as coyotes on white-tailed deer. And we've got a bear there with a um, GPS collar. Um, and we, we have fit all three animals with GPS collars. So now I want to also remind folks that this was what the um, Predator Guild had. It had pumas, bears, bobcats. It had actually wolves. Um, the landscape was basically denuded and it was cleared of predators. And so those guys were gone from the landscape, wolves and mountain lions. Um, bears were almost completely exterminated and bobcats as well were also hunted for their pelts. So there was very few of these animals left on the landscape. And then a couple that with the idea that now coyotes have moved into this landscape. And so we actually don't know much about this sort of new predator guild. And so we were trying to figure out in this next rendition, not only what were the impacts on deer, but who essentially is the top dog in this ecosystem and how do these three is now three carnivores coexist with each other on the landscape. So we just collared all of these um, animals, and these are just some of the numbers of the collars that we had. So we had 29 functioning coyote collars on 16 females and 13 males. We had 10 functioning bobcat collars. The bobcats were the hardest to collar, and they were the hardest to keep the um, collars working on. Um, so that's why the sample size is so low. And then we had 28 functioning uh, bear collars, 17 males and 11 females. 
And here are just some photos of us in the field and how we do some of that, um, that monitoring. And um, both the game department and me and Virginia Tech graduate students and, um, and other technicians uh, worked on this project. And the focus is mostly in Bath County, especially for the second part of the, the now what we now call it, the VAX II project, Virginia Appalachian Carnivore Project. Um, and, and Bath County does have a mixture of different types of forests. So it's got um, uh, a lot of mature forests, of course, but it, and it's also got different management units with some um, managed by the Nature Conservancy, some, some by um, state parks um, and things like that. And it also has just a mixture of public and private land with um, public land being in the, in the green here. And so, um, and then private is usually in the valley bottoms. So mostly the ridges and the, and the, the rugged remote, more remote stuff is private. This sorry is uh, publicly owned because uh, well, it's easier to protect areas that are hard to live on. So, so yeah, so that just gives you a picture of what this looks like. And a little bit of uh, the natural history of what these predators do on the landscape. If you're not familiar with the way um, they hunt, we've got bobcats first, and they are generally considered a stalking or ambush predator. So they hide, they hide, and then they kind of wait for the prey to 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 be not looking or or uh, not paying attention, and then jump out and and grab them essentially. But a lot of people don't understand this, but Bobcats are the most carnivorous. Actually, all cats are the most carnivorous in their diet because they have to eat. Uh, they have to eat meat to survive. They don't have any molars. They can't really survive on um, anything but meat. So their entire digestive tract and everything is really short. So they have to have high protein diets. Um, bears, on the other hand, are ambush predators, um, but are also pretty dominant scavengers. And, and their diet is much more omnivorous. Um, they're bigger, they move uh, larger distances and they're not afraid. They seem to be the top predator in the system. They're much larger than the other ones, um, but they can also survive on a bunch of different diet items. And then you've got the, the canids. All canids are coursing predators and scavengers as well. Um, also with an omnivorous diet, but are much smaller than uh, bears, of course. And they, and they can, survive on a, on a pretty wide diet. So that just gives you a little bit of background. So by coursing, that means they kind of chase animals down and they can tire them out. Um, and so we studied, we, and, and all of these predators can live in really varied habitat types from forests to deserts to shrublands to grassland to even urban and suburban environments. And so we know that they share resources. We think that they share, uh, the, that their um, habitat overlap is um, a lot. We especially thought it was maybe early to mid-successional, maybe pastures, maybe edge. Uh, same with diet. Um, and so we were wondering, given the literature that just says that they're pretty omnivorous, you know, how much would we find evidence for this once we did our study? Would it be the same or would it be different, especially considering these guys are relatively a new carnivore guild, uh, and especially considering that bears and bobcats have only recently increased on the landscape. So they, about 10 years ago is when we started to notice that bears were really increasing on the landscape. Um, and then bobcats have steadily been increasing too. So those two players have not really been maybe not much of an, uh, an issue for deer until really the last 10 years or so. So we wanted to look at patterns of habitat selection to help us predict potential for predation risk to deer. And that's one thing that my student Robert Alonzo is tackling right now and considering that, how that might affect say habitat management uh, for deer or for other carnivores, all the carnivores. So again, here's just a photograph again of Bath County and what that kind of habitat looks like. That's very, very much um, mature mixed forest um, with not a lot of variation, except in maybe in the valley bottoms. And here's some examples though of some of the other habitat types that we get. So in the lower left, 
is some areas down in the valley bottoms have pasture with uh, sparse trees. Um, there are areas on the like far right where there has been recent burns and, and the Nature Conservancy and the Forest Service have both been burning areas of the forest to create some more early successional habitat um, to potentially create a habitat mosaic rather than just an old growth forest. Um, and then in the middle is just a, a photograph of what that area looks like in the winter time. There's not a lot of understory. There's often not much there. It's mostly just these trees with a barren understory. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about how we did this analysis, except we call it third order habitat selection which is within the home range, within an animal's home range, what areas are they selecting? And this example here is from a female black bear and all the lines are connecting all of the dots about where she went from one place to the next wearing her collar. We can track this with the GPS collars and that's her movement trajectory. And then we basically look at the areas that we consider her um, overall home range, which is kind of the blue outline and then the blue outline with the blue dots in it um, is what we call the core. So it's where they seem to be spending most of their time. So we did this kind of analysis on the core of their habitat and their cores. What are they doing and what are they selecting for in these core habitats? And so we did this for not just black bears, but for bobcats, of course, and coyotes as well. And I don't wanna go into this too much, but just to suffice it to say that we can tell what habitats they select if they're on the right of the line versus which habitats they avoid if they're left of the line and they don't overlap that dotted red line. So don't pay too much attention to this, just say there's a whole lot of modeling stuff that's going on behind the scenes that I'm gonna skip over. Uh, whoops, those are just some things that they select for and against. And we did this for all three species. So let me skip through that. And then we overlaid them on top of each other and so the results of that are in this top little um, table here. And all it is showing you is the first thing that says third order habitat selection that says coyote bobcat. That number 0.56 means that they overlapped by 0.56 and the habitats that they mostly use together, which so it's pretty high. And this, the scale goes from zero to one. So one would be complete overlap and zero would be no overlap. So the habitats that they most use, EM successional is early to mid successional. Then they also both herbaceous and edge, and then they both used uh, oak, and then high TPI, which is like ruggedness. So they both use rugged areas. Coyotes and bear overlap is a little bit different. They both use early and mid successional and herbaceous edge. So those are the two that where they overlap most. And then bear and bobcat also were, were the same as coyote and bear. So they used early to mid successional herbaceous and edge. So all we're showing here is that there's even more overlap between bobcats in those areas, 0.68 versus coyotes and bobcats, 0.56. So the take home message of that top little piece is just that there's quite a bit of habitat overlap and it tends to focus in early successional habitat and herbaceous edges. Um, we looked at dietary overlap too, and because we had all that diet information that I talked about earlier, we could look at well how much diet overlap is there, and we found even almost stronger results for coyote bobcat. Lots of dietary overlap, seventy three percent almost, or seventy three yeah point seven three or seventy three percent. Coyotes and bears also overlap in their diet, and so did bobcats and bears. And so we're, we weren't seeing what we're looking for is like niche separation at these animals, are they going to like separate in what they eat? If they separated in what they eat, you would expect much lower numbers. So now they're using, it seems like they're, they're using a lot of the same habitat and they're eating a lot of the same foods. We also looked at diel, which is just time. What time of day are they active? And coyotes and bobcats, again, a zero to one scale are active at the same times of day, mostly crepuscular, um, although coyotes were slightly uh, more nocturnal. Coyotes and bears overlapped a lot as well, also a little bit more crepuscular, and bears and bobcats overlap the most. 90% of the time they were, they were basically active um, at similar times. 
And again, sorry, in the middle one with the dietary overlap, just note that all three of the carnivores, <laughs> they all had deer in their diet and then they separated out a little bit, but interesting that they all had a little bit of component of insects in there, but you can also tell that bobcats um, did not eat a lot of other things. So, so there's not, they don't have anything related to soft mass in their, um, in, in their overlap with the other animals. So I guess take home messages, a lot of overlap, more than we were expecting. We thought we might see some more stronger like partitioning of either the, either the places that they use, uh, the diet, or the time of day that they were active. Oops, my little guys, about to put them up. So then what, and I'm gonna use the royal we did, but it's really Robert Alonzo, my PhD student. He plotted across the landscape, these habitat types and where they would occur across the landscape and in a way to predict how risky is this habitat for deer. And so the darker the color is sort of like the most riskier place. So as it goes into brown and red there, that's where bobcats are, are really um, using their sort of core resource selection areas. So we, we think of it as areas where deer might find it a little scary. So there's not a lot of space there where, um, where uh, bobcats aren't, I guess, that's <laughs> a take home message. But the situation looks even worse for bears. <laughs> so bears are even more widespread and using even more of the habitat. Um, and so there's not, there are very few areas where bears did not occur. Um, and that brownish color is, is a pretty medium to high uh, area of use. So bears are using the landscape a lot. And here was the interesting thing, I think, when we plot coyotes, they're not, they're so diffuse across the landscape that here was the animal that the, the game department originally funded us to do. And it turns out that they're, they're just kind of ephemeral and all across the landscape, they're not really using certain core areas very strongly. I think they're just running around and they, you know, they might be actually the least risky animal for deer because they don't really have some core area or potentially maybe it's the opposite. Maybe because they don't have a core area, deer can't figure out where they are and they are just running around um, opportunistically when they see a deer going after it. So we're still struggling with interpretation, but if you plot all three of those across the landscape on top of each other, it's gonna be hard for a deer to avoid any predator except in those little yellow areas, which is still medium risk but it's not even the high risk, which is anything darker than yellow. So I think the take home message would maybe be, um, it, it might suck to be a deer. That's all <laughs> across this landscape. Poor things don't have a chance. They got, they've got predators all over the landscape that they're trying to uh, deal with that have different hunting styles that they have to be aware of. So to conclude that part, the habitat selected by carnivores, um, uh, they do select areas like that, that early successional, like we saw and mid successional that might and edge habitat, which might be really good for deer. So that's a little bit frightening for a deer, but they like that edge habitat and the carnivores are definitely targeting that. There are some hot spots of interaction risk, but honestly, they're mostly all across the landscape. But maybe we can do some management of some less common successional forests so, or maybe open up some of the habitat a little bit use, with the use of cover, sorry, with the use of fire, and uh, maybe even some timber management, which I know some people uh, balk at this idea of um, cutting or clearing any forests, but a lot of that forest in, in the Appalachian Mountains now, especially where we worked, is becoming quite old, and it's past its, its prime. We have noticed that acorn production is declining, which also could be, um, and this is irrespective of weather patterns. This is just a decline in acorn production. We think because the trees are so old now that they're just not very productive, which is also bad for deer because that's one of the common things that deer uh, key in on. So this is something we're talking about. What about uh, doing fire and um, maybe some thinning and timber extraction across the landscape? So it's not just in these few places in Bath County where where uh, predators are already um, queuing in on. 
So the one thing that we weren't able to analyze with our diet analysis is what about predation on deer versus scavenging on deer? And I love this picture from our scavenging study because what's happening here is we, we put a deer carcass out on the landscape and it's tied to that tree. And we've got a coyote. First, the bobcat was feeding on it. Then we have a coyote that comes in and the bobcat just sits down and watches this thing forage for like half an hour. It sits for a while, then it lies down for a while. Then the coyote takes off and then the bobcat goes back to eating. So we had this whole series of these photographs, which were really great. So I'll talk a little bit about our scavenging work that we were doing. And this is part of VAX2, so the carnivore study, the sub goal to investigate scavenging uh, versus can we get at whether the animals are actually killed by the predators or are they just scavenging road kills across the landscape? So we just started doing this exploratory data analysis uh, to gain insight on the scavenging community. And we literally took roadkill deer from VDOT and we put them out on the landscape, again, tied to trees. And then we put uh, remote cameras on trees next to those scavenged carcasses. And we tried to uh, get photographs of what is the scavenging community and do they all scavenge? And up to this time, it was thought that Bobcats were the least of the scavengers. And so, um, so um, and that we thought the bears and coyotes did it, but we weren't sure if bobcats did it very much if they, instead if they were just straight up hunting. And there's not a lot known about scavenging despite the fact that it seems to be widespread and it really does affect community dynamics. Um, it can inflate predation rates if we're just looking at scat sampling, which is what we did for our diet analysis. Uh, it, it, you might think that all that deer in the scat samples is the result of these animals killing the deer, but I don't think so. I think a lot of it could be a component of it, maybe even a large component could be from um, actually just scavenging road kills um, or something like that. And in, in addition, we wanted to understand something about the dynamics too, about these within species and between species interactions around the, around the carcasses. So here's a couple of my graduate students, Darby in the top and Brogan in the bottom, and they're doing this horrible job of taking kind of gross um, road kills and uh, hauling them to our randomly assigned GPS points um, at 10 kilometers apart so that we didn't have just the same animal hitting, hitting, uh, the same, uh, hitting different carcasses across the landscape. We secured these things to trees. We set up one to three infrared camera traps. And that's what you can see in the second photo on the right is there's a carcass there that's tied to a tree. That one has already completely been eaten, but when we put it out there, it wasn't. And then there are cameras on these trees here so we can get a wide view of who is coming to these carcasses and what is going on. And here's just an interesting sequence of what we were so surprised about is the multiple carnivores coming in the same day. Here is a Bobcat coming at 9.42 in the morning, then a coyote coming later in the day at four o'clock, then a bear on that same carcass at like seven, like eight o'clock uh, or something like that. And then um, at nighttime at 10 o'clock, a coyote comes back. At um, 11 o'clock, the bear comes back, coyote comes back. So it's back and forth, back and forth until even that same bobcat comes back. So, um, so this is a very, very interesting um, thing that we didn't expect that there would be these multiple carnivores coming at the same time and or within close succession to each other. So we did a little analysis on this and let's just look at what we have found. And latency to detection just means how long does it take them to find a carcass? And interestingly, on average, coyotes were the fastest. It took them about four and a half days. And this is an average. So some of them were found really fast. Some of them, it took a little bit longer, but coyotes seem to be the fastest to find them on average. Bobcats were second on average, and then black bears were third. Um, this next photo is, um, uh, this next graph is um, order of arrival. So how many times on average did, did bobcats come first? So the lower number means that they came first. A higher number means they came later. And this is just averaged um, um, over, a, over a bunch of different carcasses. And it's broken into winter and spring. So the lighter colored bars on the left 
are winter spring, and then the darker colored bars on the right are summer fall. So interestingly, in winter and spring, when there are no, think about that, there's no bears present because bears are hibernating. So bobcats found, uh, bobcats got their, um, generally their order was first of the three that got there. And then coyotes were second and uh, bears were third, they, obviously because most of the time they're in hibernation, but towards the end, but towards the end of spring, they can start coming out. Uh, and then that order sort of flipped when we went into summer fall. Bears got really good at finding carcasses and their order was first. Um, and then coyotes was second and bobcats were third. So coyotes were intermediate and it was, we had this really interesting seasonal thing happen where bobcats were first in the spring, bears were first in the summer. Let's see, slide, there we go. Um, and this is really interesting too. And I forgot to put in here, but uh, let me go back one. I forgot to put in here, we have a third graph that it shows a similar relationship, but it, it looks at it looks at time on the carcass. So how many minutes do they spend? And take home message from that is bears spend a lot of time and they just hang out there. Bears and bobcats they hang out there until the coyotes just kind of quickly run in and run out and grab a piece and run away with it. That seemed to be the pattern. Um, and don't worry about reading all those words at the bottom. This is just a graph to show you that we looked at things like, well, what affected how long animals spent on a carcass. And this was really interesting. We thought that vultures, which is in the bottom, uh, all were positive related to the amount of time that these animals spent on a carcass. So that line is going upward, meaning that bears are spending more and more time on a carcass, especially strong for bears. You can see that on the far right, that for bears, um, the more time that vultures spend on a carcass, the more time bears spend. So I think that bears are queuing in to vultures, but the same was true for coyotes. Also queuing in on vultures, they spent more time when there were more incidents of vultures there. And the same for bobcats. So the strongest for bears, medium for coyotes, and then not as strong for bobcats. So it seems to imply that bears, that actually all three predators notice vultures out on the landscape and they might get out there see them circling around and go and try to find that carcass. So that's pretty cool. And this has been shown in other ecosystems um, like in Africa where, thing, where everything is very wide open and there's often open plains and things like that. But this has not really been shown for um, Appalachian um, carnivores. Um, so this is pretty exciting that we kind of found uh, uh, an effect that seemed to be something that usually happens only in the plains of Africa, for example. Then we compared the carnivores to each other. So was there any, in, any um, idea that these guys are competing with each other? So if they are, we would expect this line to flip the other way. Instead of the line going upward, we would expect it to go downward if, they were, if there were some negative interactions between the carnivores. So here's what we found. We've got, whoops, those didn't pop up right. There we go, this is it. Um, so this is what we, well, that's, that's Hmm, okay. Oh, I see. Okay, this is correct. I just had the order different from how I remembered it. <laughs> um, so the first graph on the left here is bobcats against coyotes. So if coyotes were impacting bobcats, we'd see this line be negative or, or having a downward trend. And instead, we see almost no relationship, maybe a slightly positive one. Same for bobcats and bears. We don't, the line is not super strong, but it is a little bit downward. So perhaps this is indicating that um, Bobcats are not happy when bears are on carcasses a lot, so maybe they might avoid them. The trend is not strong, but it is slightly negative. And interestingly, we go back to a positive relationship with an upward turning line. When bears are spending a lot of time on carcasses, coyotes seem to go and also spend more time on carcasses. So this was pretty interesting to us as well. We did not see any very strong negative interactions um, between these species. So some key takeaways from the scavenging portion of our study is that bobcats, coyotes, and black bear uh, duration times were mostly positively influenced by duration time of vultures. Um, our results don't seem to suggest there's not a lot of competition like interference where they're interfering with each other at carcass sites. Instead, maybe they're facilitating each other. If there's a lot of activity, um, maybe 
the carnivores are like noticing it and they go and check it out with the exception of potentially bobcats and bears. But I will say that uh, since bobcats like to camp out at carcasses and so do bears, rather than coyotes that like to just rip off a little piece and run away, that maybe if a, if a bear has been there, a bobcat might just say, oh, forget it, because I like to spend my time hanging out there and I'm not gonna get a chance to do that. <laughs> so, so that might lead to that slight negative between what should say bobcats and bears in that last bullet point. Okay, so one thing I wanted to mention is that we attempted to do, because all these animals had these collars on, we attempted to do what we call cluster searching, which is when you, you're getting the downloads from the caller going to a satellite and they're downloading literally to your computer. You can go look up where these animals are almost in real time. We were doing it like every couple of days we were doing the downloads. And so we could go see whether, so we can plot the points on the map and see whether or not the bears or any of the predators had like, they weren't moving, like they were camped out on a carcass. And then we would literally send field teams immediately to go out and see if they were on a carcass and see if they had killed it or if they had scavenged it. And not to go into details on that, but there are fairly standard and pretty easy ways to tell if a carcass is scavenged versus, um, versus actually killed. Um, we can talk about that later if people are interested. So, so this was a monumental effort. Field teams running out there immediately to go check out those carcasses, see if this, they could determine who was being killed or not um, on the landscape. And it worked pretty well for bobcats and coyotes. We were able to get out there. We were, were able to see a cluster, run out there and find the kill. Um, but it was, we, it just resulted in really small sample sizes. And so um, it was, and, and it was basically impossible to do this for bears. It did not work at all for bears. I think because bears eat so fast and they would just scavenge that thing down so that by the time we got to the carcass, there was like nothing left generally. So instead, to get at this for um, bears, we use these uh, video collars. So this bear is not only wearing a GPS unit, it's also wearing a video camera that is taking um, nine to 20 seconds of video every 20 to 60 minutes, depending on how we program them. And so what we were looking at was fawn predation in Bath County and, um, and uh, seeing were they, in addition to scavenging, were they also killing fawns? So back up one second. It was unknown how much fawn predation there was on, on, uh, by the predators, uh, by the game. And the game department wanted to know this because at first they were worried again that coyotes were killing fawns because they were the newest predator on the landscape. Um, we were able to go in with the cluster searches and, and we found very few, very little evidence of fawn kills, mostly in those cluster searches. We had adult kills for coyotes and bobcats or scavenging events. But with the, these camera collars, we were actually able to document fawn uh, predation. Um, in, in general, for the most part, it was predation. And not much is known about these effects on deer populations. So, so we don't necessarily think about this. We think about, oh, they're killing adult deer, but to be honest, maybe it's the fawn portion of the population that is really getting, getting hammered by these animals. Um, and are there specific landscape attributes that might lead to um, where these fawns get killed and where these bears um, uh, feed on them? And maybe do males do this more than females, et cetera. So these are some of the questions that we are answering right now. Um, and just keep in mind that peak fawning is June 17th in this area. And we know that from a sister study that was going on at the same time on deer, where they had deer collared and they had fawns collared. Um, yeah, we're looking forward to combining our two data sets to get more of this predator-prey interaction. But for now, I'll just talk to you about uh, bear fawn predation. So this graph that I'm showing here is Bath County again. And the blue is all the video events, just all the video events uh, we had total. And the yellow squares are where we documented um, bears consuming deer across the landscape. So quite a few, there are quite a few documentations of uh, bears consuming deer on the landscape. I don't know if this video will play and I didn't put a lot of videos in my PowerPoint only because um, sometimes Zoom doesn't like them, but I'll, I'll try and play it 
And if you can see it at all, it's a bear that's actually killing a fawn. So it's it's not too gruesome, but just be aware that it is rushing in and there it is nabbing that fawn. So sorry if it's jumpy and jumping around on your end, but on, on my end, I can see this bear looking through the leaves, running quickly and just nabbing this fawn that is clearly alive. And so he has killed it. Oops, let me get out of the video here. Okay, so what were some of our results from, from documenting all of this uh, predation and scavenging events? Um, here we have males in blue and females in red. And the first thing to kind of note is the number of deer that were in the adult, that were in the diet. So this is just looking at meat items consumed and we documented everything that we saw. By and large, it's mostly fawns. That's, yeah, sad to say, uh, 17 fawns got, Killed by, killed or eaten by uh, males. Most of those were predation. There were a couple of instances of like a, um, like a um, what we would call maybe a stillborn that looked like looked stillborn. Didn't look didn't look like a healthy uh, deer. And so, but we still included that in here. But those were very few. Most of these were quite healthy looking fawns. Um, and females killed more than males, uh, which is interesting because we had fewer females collared than males. Uh, and we also had documented adult kills, again, more by females than uh, by males, interesting, interestingly. And then I wanted to highlight also this bear, uh, this thing that says bear with uh, six. We had one bear kill six other bears and consume them. Well, we're not sure if it was six bears total or if it was if it repeatedly came back to the same bear. We need to match up the GPS coordinates and see if it was coming back to the same spot or not but we know that there were definitely three different bears that that bear killed. That same bear also killed a raccoon. So my graduate students named him Hannibal because he was just killing. He was a killer. So he killed a lot of animals, uh, especially compared to the other uh, bears. We break this down by fawns versus adults. Look at this. these numbers on the bottom where all these are individual bears. So it's like bear 1185, bear 1407, and the left panel is um, females and the right panel is male bears. And you can see that some do it more than others. So if you look at 1193 on the female side, she was responsible for nine fawn kills um, and um, was consuming, was uh, doing consumption on at least three adults. So that's pretty, pretty interesting, whereas the males, looks like um, they also killed, there were a couple that killed seven, but the winner by far is one female that killed the most fawns. So, um, so the, yeah, so it's a lot of variation there, but some do a lot of killing and some do very little or no killing of fawns like 1168. And then the last graph I'll show you is when does that killing happen? Again, reminder here that peak fawning date is June 17th in that study area, denoted by that black line. And you can see that the females are doing a lot of that fawn killing. They're in red or pinkish red. And that's all of, and that's the, sorry, that's not the number of fawns. That's the duration of time that they are cons spent consuming or eating because uh, we, we took track of the begin time and the end time. So they're spending a lot of time um, consuming deer earlier before June 15th, say before peak fawning. So maybe they're getting the very early fawns whereas males are getting the fawns a little bit later than females. And then after like July 1st, we switch to very little, uh, very little um, eating of fawns, except for a strange little peak around July 20th, which we're not sure what's going on there. But, uh, but anyway, that's, that's the, um, some of the results for the consum consumption of deer fawns. Uh, and if you could scale this up, this would be really interesting to understand black bear in impacts across the landscape. And there's a video of a bear eating a fawn. We can skip that one. Um, uh, we've got 44 total white-tailed deer consumed with 38 fawns across 15 bears, which is equivalent to about 2.9 or almost three, three deer being killed per bear or 2.5 fawns being killed per bear um, in, in just this uh, study, but what we don't have is really a good estimate of how many bears there are on the landscape. If we did have that, we could scale this up and sort of figure out 
what is that consumption rate across the entire landscape? And that would be very cool to do. So that's something that we're hoping for next. We are also doing a literature review of diet composition that people do from like scat samples and comparing that to vegetation, to, no, sorry, to our camera collar data. And what we have found is that if you're just looking at diet composition on the left as the literature review, uh, you probably would miss a lot of the vegetation because it might make, maybe it's leafy greens and, and we were able to see the leafy green stuff in the videos and get what we think is a more accurate uh, composition of the overall diet uh, for bears, which is on the right. So interestingly, they mostly eat vegetation um, and their amount of animal uh, eating is much lower, um, even though they are, that is almost entirely composed of deer, but it's much lower compared to the total amount of vegetation. I think I've just got a couple more slides here that might show you also how that changes from spring to summer. So the left panel here is just showing that male composition, diet composition is mostly vegetation. If you break it down by spring, though, you'll see that in this they have a dramatic jump. Again, probably those poor fawns getting hit by bears uh, compared to summer, which is all the way in the right, where that red sliver, which is animals, is much, much lower. So, so the diet does change seasonally. And in spring, uh, they are targeting fawns. And the females are doing the same thing. Here's females overall. And again, female. Um, uh, is also the females are also targeting fawns in the spring and less much less in the summer. So we've got this really interesting shift in diet composition that we could see um, seasonally. Yeah, and there's that change there from uh, what they eat seasonally. And then the last graph I'll kind of show you is uh, another thing that changes is uh, what they switch to. Um, in the spring versus summer. So spring is in green and summer is in yellow. And the main thing to draw your attention to is this here, this dramatic switch from soft mass, which is um, um, digestible, which means like leaves, leaves and stuff. Uh, so plant leaves, um, that switches. They have most, they're mostly eating that in spring and then summer they don't eat very much of that. And then, sorry, that last piece is showing you that the soft mass indigestible, which is like fruit seeds, like you think of raspberry or blueberry or, or blackberry seeds, those don't get uh, digested very easily. So we they they go through um, the system and, and would be picked up in a in a scat sample. But soft mass would not be picked up in a in a scat sample. So you might not notice this habitat change unless, I mean sorry, this diet change unless you had this data that we have from these video cameras. There is a lot of variation. On average, females had more variation in their diet than males. And the males are in blue, and these are just individual males. And honestly, if it wasn't for this one male that had a really varied diet, the males would have a much, much lower um, diet breadth than females, which ate a lot more different things uh, in general than males did. So lots of individual variation. And again, here's just males showing that they averaged about two different 2.1 different animal types, ranging from one to six animal types, and females really only ate by animal types. They really had just a lower amount of animal types in their diet. And of course, the most common were deer, fawns, and adults, and those are described as two different types of um, animals. So all of this, basically, I'm just wrapping this up now. It's all a work in progress. We haven't really, um, I haven't really tried to pull this together yet from VAX1 to VAX2, and VAX2 is very much a work in progress. I've got one student defending um, this month, a little bit later this month, um, the one who is doing all the niche overlap, and that's Robert. And then I've got Brogan, who is my master's student, who will be defending in May, and that's the bear diet from the camera collars. And then the two side projects are the scavenging and the bear fawn predation specifically, in addition to multiple other little side projects that we have got so much extra data from, from this project. So I think we've learned some really valuable things from all of this. Key findings are that coyotes were not the main predator on deer as originally thought, and they were not the big bad wolf, as um, which is what originally funded our studies. Uh, and that essentially all three predators kill and scavenge on deer with 
to, to a surprise to most, most bears being the most likely um, in, exhibiting the most important effects on deer and coyotes, maybe even the least with bobcats being somewhere in the middle. Um, and all three predators have extremely high overlap in their niche with very subtle preferences that change seasonally and, and are habitat mediated. Um, the landscape is risky almost everywhere out there for deer and they have to contend with different hunting styles and different strategies of these three predators. And maybe one possibility out there is that we could in increase habitat for deer that deer like, like early successional through fire and maybe timber harvest as these fo forests get older and start to senesce. So I think that is gonna be my, for now, my take home. We've got a lot of other things we're working on that hopefully will be um, summarized soon. And there have been a lot of funders of this project over time. Of course, Virginia Tech and the department, or now called the DWR, but also Virginia Deer Hunters Association, VT Graduate School, Nature Conservancy, U.S. Forest Service, Safari Club International, um, et cetera. And so with that, I would be happy to take any questions if you have them. Let me stop my screen sharing here. I can figure out how to do that. I have a question. Sure. Um, how how does the bear bobcat uh, predation compare to roadkill and hunting? I mean, are there more human caused um, deer uh, yeah. deaths? <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I can tell you that when we were picking up deer uh, on the side of the road, there was no shortage of them. And so I honestly think there's no shortage of deer to scavenge on. And every single deer that we put out on the landscape was found and was completely consumed by those predators. And so I think that we might be underestimating the importance of that. And, and, and also it does increase, of course, during hunting season and during the rut, which is fall. And so in fall, we may have an increased amount of deer on the landscape in the form of scavenging. So, so that could actually be bolstering the population of these predators because they've got ample uh, deer to eat, uh, especially as it's getting colder and, and for bears as they're going into winter hibernation. So it could actually increase their ability to hibernate uh, effectively. Thank you. Someone's asking the question, what is the human food listed in the diet of the bear? Ah, great question. I didn't have time to chat about that, but um, mostly it was orchards. Honestly, it was mostly de uh, deer getting into orchards and climbing up trees and, um, and eating off of those, um, those orchard trees. Or sometimes there were bait piles because hunters will put out corn for bait. And sometimes they would get into those bait piles and they would eat corn. But surprisingly, we found very little evidence of trash. Again, Bath County doesn't have a huge component of urbanness where they might be getting into urban trash cans or something like that. But this, but we were surprised that we found so little. Now that could change in an area that has more uh, urbanization for sure. So you another did question, all go ahead. Um, you did almost all your study in Bath County, you said, right? For this, well, for what I talked about today, yes, we also have done a bunch of camera work in um, in uh, Giles Craig, and now we're starting some down uh, by the BRDC in uh, what county is that? That's down there somewhere. <laughs> I'm forgetting the county right I now. guess the reason why I'm asking is because in Montgomery County, it seems like there's way more deer than anybody wants or that the landscape can hold. So yeah, um, it's it's interesting to see that there are strategies from your study for making more deer, which is like- Yeah, I know people are used to- I haven't yes. heard in a long time. People we have way, surprised. way, way more deer here than we did 20 years ago. Yeah, people are very surprised by that. And this is definitely a forested, like a, a heavily forested area with very, very little, um, openings and very, which deer like. And so anytime you have more open habitat, which you're gonna get in Montgomery County, you have you just have more farms, you have more open areas, deer really like that and gardens and, you know, more urbanization. They actually do better in those areas. And of course in the Piedmont, they do great. Like that, their problem is overpopulation of deer. And so it's very interesting that this is um, something that people don't 
realize is that in the forested counties, deer are tanking across the board. They're just huh. not doing well. Well, I kept thinking as you were talking that I'd be happy to share some of my deer. <laughs> yeah. Well, well export some. <laughs> yeah, I know. I wish it was that easy. <laughs> they love that habitat. They love that habitat. They don't really like that heavily forested environment. There are some places in the forest around here where that where there's no undergrowth at all. Because yeah, you can see you can see the damage that they do. They can't, they, there's nothing left. And so that's what's happening now is if they don't, if the acorns are now starting to dry up, they're actually really starting to, to suffer, which is yeah, something surprising that people don't really understand and or don't realize. Have you seen any evidence of mountain lions in the course of your studies? We have not. In Virginia. Um, no, we have not. Uh, occasionally, you know, there'll be somebody who thinks they've seen one or they'll show a photo, but it's never been conclusive. Um, not, that's, that's not to say that it can't happen. I think that Appalachia would be a great place for mountain lions. They would do quite well if they make it, if they make it here. And there is evidence they've made it to Tennessee and they're moving across the landscape. And so I think it's a matter of time. The ones that have been actually seen, there have been a couple, have all turned out to be escaped pets. Um, so there have been a, have been a couple there haven't but there's no like breeding population that we know of um so yeah that's kind of where we're at with that but the game department is definitely watching that one because they're very worried <laughs> about what's going to happen and who's going to you know you either love them or you hate them and there's going to be a lot of controversy when that when that happens <laughs> so. another chat question someone wants to know if the study period included a mass periodic cicada emergence. Uh, apparently there was one in 2016. And also, was there any analysis of insect species preyed upon? Uh, yes, I can tell you about the, I don't think we actually did any of this study in 2016. So we did 2011 to 2014, 20, uh, and then we had like a two year break. So I think we sadly missed that, which would have been so great to have this information on, but what we did see in the in the videos was um, the insects were primarily ants, uh, termites, and grubs. So they would rip apart uh, trees and just lick like crazy, licking at all the uh, termites and pulling them out of the trees. And then same same with uh, they would go through the forest and flip rocks, and you could see them just walking. It was really cool in the video. They just flip rock after rock and then lick up ants and lick up grubs and things like that. And so very actively searching for insects. So it was definitely like a behavior that they were doing. It wasn't just they happened to find them. And then, oh, and a really cool one was we saw a bear digging in a hole and we didn't know what it was doing. And then it opened up this nest of bees and it just ate them all down, just gobbled them all up. So I was like, what? I had no idea bears would eat a bee's nest. I, I, no, they didn't care. They didn't care if it was getting stung on the nose or anything. It was just wow. gobbling them. So. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so now we're starting to see bear in you know in urban our urban areas. So is that because yeah. of the deer? Uh, no, I think that's well partly. Uh, it could partly be, but from what we found, bears are really queuing in only on fawns, um, and that might be just because of the nature of coming out of hibernation, extremely hungry. And they just move, and we don't necessarily think that they're actively they're actively moving across the landscape. But we we we're not finding evidence like are they targeting fawns or are they just they're just zigzagging across the landscape and they happen to come across a fawn and they just eat it. And so that's what it seems like. We don't see them actively like targeting adult deer. Um, not to say that it can't happen; they could do it. But I think the urban stuff is just that they can eat a lot of different things, and that, I think that. A uh, cheeseburger is pretty good for them. They don't care. Like you know, they'll eat anything. And if there's any kind of in urban areas, the conflict is usually with garbage. They usually come in and they're getting into garbage cans or getting on people's porches and eating their bird seed from their bird feeders. They really can eat everything. And so the more in urban areas, you get a lot more of that stuff. And it's high calorie. So they can really, they can really go far on that high calorie uh, sort of junk food, if you want to call it that for bears. You know?
maybe we just need to put more junk food out there on the landscape for bears and they'll stop eating the deer in Bath County. <laughs> Yeah, great questions. Uh, I've got a question. <clears throat> yep. I came in a little late, so forgive me if you answered this already, but uh, what, when do bears in this area come out of hibernation? Uh, it kind of depends on the elevation. Um, they should be coming out in Bath County. It's pretty late. It's actually not until late April, uh, early, can be even early May for, for, for bears there. Um, Actually, it's, it's probably more like mid-May in, in Bath County because that elevation and they get a lot of snow sometimes. So here it might be a little bit earlier, would probably be around um, probably middle of April, could be a little bit earlier, but sometimes like if, it, if you get these warm spells like we've been having, sometimes they can pop awake and, and, and kind of wander around a little, like looks like they're a little bit drugged sometimes. And then they can kind of go back if, it, if a cold snap happens again. So there is something weird that's going on, and especially as the climate gets more unpredictable, it could be really interesting to see how bears react to that. Because um, it's not it's not just climate; they do they do hibernate in this area. But if it, but we have sort of noticed over the years that these very warm spells disrupt their hibernation patterns. Um, uh, but they don't like fully come out. At least what we think is by mid April. So did maybe I misunderstood um, what what you said, but I thought that are they considering cutting down the the or burning burning the trees that are no longer producing acorns in order to make more deer habitat? That's what they're playing? yeah yeah essentially they're uh, trying and and they're just toying around with the ideas and they already are starting prescribed burns to mimic sort of what we've, we've kind of lost the natural fire regime. So that area in Bath County had natural fires and had open areas. And well, we used to have bison in the area and we used to have elk. These, these animals would not be able to survive in these forest environments as they are now. So there must have been openings. Um, and then they would have kept them open by their grazing, continual grazing on, on some of these areas. And so, um, they think that, um, so, so they're starting to introduce fire to try to more mimic that natural um, sort of succession that might've happened or that natural pattern that might've happened, but it's, it's still hard to know what that natural pattern was, how often it was, um, how intense the fires were. So there, that's a whole field of study that I better not even talk about because I don't know enough about fire to, to say much about that. And then the timber extraction is also happening for the, for the same reason. Um, and, and basically they're just choosing sections um, in small sections, they're not really large sections. And most of those are all old trees. Like there's not a lot of young trees in areas of the central Appalachians and Bath County. So I'm not, it's a great question. I don't exactly know how they're choosing their plots that they decide to burn. Um, but I think almost all of it is pretty old with, with trees that are, are senescing. Um, so, so yeah, great question. I need to talk to the TNC and the Forest Service and all those people that are responsible for doing those, those kinds of things. Oh, Bruce has a question in the chat, but also I have a question. So what do you mean by senescing? Because old growth forest sort of an old growth forest is, is, is a, not a climax, it's a constant replacement and the trees die and the new young ones come. And some of that's been hurt by the heavy deer population, although it sounds like there's not many deer in those areas. So what do you mean by senescing? Yeah, just that the acorn production is declining um, and, and especially in the last 10 years, uh, pretty dramatically. So there, and there is no, you're right, there is no, uh, there are no young trees coming up. The understory is completely clear. If you've been in some of those areas, it's remarkable. So even though there are not that, that many deer left, they did their damage and there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of um, new shoots coming up and the deer that are there are eating them. Um, and probably also small mammals and other things are eating the, any, any new stuff that comes up. 
And so, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a great question. So there's just not, there's just not a lot of young trees um, in, in a lot of that forest. The understory is quite clear and you can see browse lines, even, even though there aren't that many deer there. So, so it is pretty interesting. It's a kind of a, kind of an interesting mix of, of senescing trees and deer populations. Who knows, maybe if, a, if all the deer were gone, some trees could actually make it past, past those little, that little stage when they're, when they're so vulnerable. Um, so yeah, that's a great question too. Chat question. If the habitat has changed to be less usable for deer, why would VDWR study to find out why the deer population has dropped? Not that your study isn't fascinating and informative. Yeah, I think it's taken a while for people to, to really come around to this idea. I think that it's something that um, wasn't, I would say 10 years ago, I would say when we were funded, they weren't thinking about that really, this whole idea that the forest was uh, not as productive. Um, and they weren't, and I mean, they were thinking about it reintroducing fire and getting uh, deer habitat, and people were complaining about deer declining. Um, and so they did do that sister study with deer, um, where they studied deer and looked at um, collared, GPS collared deer and things like that. And um, that was interesting because it found, well, its findings are being kind of written up right now, but um, that they, have the capacity to grow um, and that they really do focus on those early successional habitats. It's just that there's not very many of them. So the deer are kind of enough are making it through um, the sort of predator gauntlet, but there's not enough habitat to have them grow more. They're just kind of staying at this level right now or they're declining a little bit. Um, so, and predators have been increasing. So we are seeing this possibility of this combination in that area of decreased quality of habitat for deer, increased predators, kind of this nexus kind of happening at the same time, that's just not great for deer. And so, um, so yeah, it is an interesting, it's an interesting question. Um, so hopefully we've given them some, some insight and you know, I'm not, I'm not the one to make the decision about where to cut. And I'm a little bit nervous about saying that that's the best strategy as you know, predators seem to love that habitat, um, but would they love it without deer? I don't know. I have a question. Have you heard of the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative? No, I haven't. What is that? Um, well, it's, it's a group that's been seeking to show the historical relationship of widespread grasslands throughout the southeastern United States historically that disappeared over the last few centuries uh, since uh, European incursions. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I would love that. I know that there's been a lot of work in Appalachia to show that it was much more dynamic and not as forested as we had originally thought it was. So, um, but again, that's kind of getting into the paleontological record and out, a little bit out of my area. Um, but I'm always really interested to know like, what was the habitat actually like? What was it like before when there were all these big, not only big predators, but big herbivores on the landscape um, like bison and elk. Uh, it's really interesting. We had a speaker who was talking about the reintroduce, reintroducing elk to the far southwest, a couple of counties in the far southwest. And I wonder, there's probably not any talk about doing that into Bath County or any of those other kind of counties that are along that border there, West Virginia. No, not yet. Um, and so that's also quite controversial. So I think they're kind of yeah. seeing it seeing how, it, how is it working out uh, down there in Bottertock County and seeing if it's actually, I think they, I think their first hunt was last year, was um, mm -hmm. their first, six, first opening hunt after this reintroduction program and they sold six tags and they got, all six people got an elk. So, um, so you know, that, that's a big driver. Hunters are really interested in seeing them. Um, it, but it's one thing to hit a white-tailed deer on, with your car, and it's another thing to hit an elk with your car. <laughs> and so there's a lot of worry from, from VDOT's perspective of, you know, 
these big, big animals getting um, into areas that are more urban or could potentially, you know, get closer to say Montgomery or something like that. It would be fascinating, but everybody's kind of watching the elk reintroduction and seeing. Right now, they don't seem like they're expanding very much. They seem to be kind of kept in that area. So I don't know if a natural expansion is possible. Right. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting. But no, they're not actively talking about that as far as I know. Which Would they ever uh, relocate deer from one area to another? I don't think so. They, yeah, they don't usually do that. I think, um, yeah, maybe just too much, too much money, too much, uh, too hard to do that. So we uh, all have some weird volunteers. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> Oh, well, I, I want to thank you so much for speaking to us and, and talking about this really interesting research that you're doing. It's kind of a lot of food for thought. So um, yeah, thank great. you so much. It's been really, really interesting. Sure. Yeah, thanks. It was very fun to have you guys. So <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, if anyone has questions, can they, um, any further questions, could they email you? Could yeah, you sure. No problem with that. Email in the chat, maybe. Yeah, do you want me to put it in there right now? That would that. be terrific, yeah. Oops. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Happy to, happy to answer any questions if I can, or one of my students can. Their <laughs> brains are really in this like, <laughs> all the time, every day. So. All right. Thanks again. It's been really, sure really interesting. <laughs>